together with Ashley Cameron, we welcome you to the penultimate session of the CPD um, that we hold in Greenway Chambers for this year. Now, I don't want to be the first person to suggest that barristers have limited skills in any way, <laughs> but the reality is, is that we are strategic advisors. And so, so often we will come in and we would advise on one issue, and it might be for a couple of days, it might be for a few years, but that one issue is usually only in relation to the legal issues and we don't necessarily always delve into the commercial side of the business. And that's one of the things that you do need to consider when um, advising the client in respect of the way that the legal issues may play out for a business. So one of the things that we're going to be looking at tonight is how to um, look into parts of the business, interact with different parts of the client and the business, but also communication skills. Because so often, when we do present, um, it is playing to our forum. So the way that we might present in court might be different to the way that we negotiate. But it also might not be the way um, to present in different parts to the client, um, and particularly with written skills as well. That's another part that we'll be looking at tonight. Also, we'll be looking at building relationships within our team, um, with the client as well, networking and also marketing skills. And one thing that barristers should not be advising on is social media, and that's one of the last things that we will be looking at as well. <laughs> but before we kick off our questions, um, Ashley will introduce our panellists for this evening. Yes. So we have three wonderful panellists today. Firstly, to my left, we have Jane Webster. She's General Counsel and Company Secretary at National Intermodal. She's been there since August of 2014. Um, for those who don't know, National Intermodal is a, an Australian government-owned corporation established to support the delivery and operation of intermodal sorry, terminals across Australia's east coast, so it deals with inland rail. Um, before being at Intermodal, Jane was a senior lawyer and compliance manager at As Asiano, Asiano, yeah. Asiano um, which is a rail and cargo ports operator. And prior to that, she was a senior associate at the construction infrastructure and major projects teams at Material Assembly. Very good. <laughs> I hope I've got all these right. <laughs> Your LinkedIn program. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, next in the middle, we have Simone Wetton. Um, Simone is a lead partner in the corporate in the corporate and commercial team at Colin Biggers and Paisley. She's been there since February of 14. Um, she also holds a number of corporate roles. So she's the chair of Legs on the Wall, which is a physical theatre company. Uh, I don't De perform. <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Chair of Sydney University Sports and Fitness Limited. Board Director at Grata Fund, which is um, an organisation in relation to access to justice. Um, Board Director at the Griffin Theatre Company. And Deputy Chair of the Sydney Stedford. She is also proficient in German. And she's a reporter for ABC's What's On in Sydney. So. The fun part. <laughs> Finally, on the on my far left, uh, we have Mary Constantopoulos. Um, perfect. Oh, well done. <laughs> Honestly, I was waiting I mean, for Mary Kay. That's perfect. <laughs> well done. I was practicing all afternoon, I must say. Um, uh, Mary is the policy governance manager at CBA, so she's re responsible for de developing risk management frameworks for CBA. Outside of her day job, Mary has a media company called Ladies Who, which encourages women to get involved in conversations about sport uh, through various spin-offs, including Ladies Who League, Ladies Who Leg Spin, Ladies Who Line Out, Ladies Who W League, and Ladies Who Leap. So there's something for everyone. There is. Um, she also writes for NRL.com and The Raw, and she has a weekly podcast, Ladies Who League in Winter and Ladies Who League Leg Spin in Summer, uh, as part of ABC Grandstand. If she finds the time, she's also the board, on the board of Hockey Australia and she's an ambassador for Full Stop Foundation. Thank you. So, I'll hand over to Adele to start kick us off with some questions. Um, uh, Jane, um, the first question. So, National Intermodal is governed by a board of directors and those directors have various skills, legal, business, technical. How do you approach your presentations to the board to take into account those various backgrounds? Thanks, Adele. Um, well, obviously, the board of any company, whether you're in an ASX company, a private company, or a you know, government-owned company, they're the ultimate decision maker. You're usually comprised with you know quite a 
experienced, um, well-credentialed uh, set of um, set of directors. Our board being a good example of that. Um, but I think in approaching directors, at the end of the day, you've got to pitch it at the right level, um, irrespective of what their background is. They're concerned around strategy, um, execution, risk. It's really looking at the strategic priorities of the company. So they're not going to be um, interested in a presentation or a board paper that's totally down in the weeds. You've really got to make, you've got to talk, talk their language, pitch it at the right level, align your paper to the strategic values and direction of the business. It's, at the end of the day, where's the value being created? What are you actually trying to achieve here? So I think approaching whether you, it's a paper or a presentation, um, what do you want to achieve is obviously your first question. Pitching it at that right level, um, what's the outcome and what is that journey that you're going to take the directors on without going down those rabbit holes. So I think when you're presenting that paper, you're obviously taking a paper as read, you're presenting that paper, you've got 30 seconds to really grab their attention, um, have credibility, know your stuff is, I think, a given. It's really around how you engage with them and how you bring them into, I guess, being part of that decision-making process. It's like, how do you engage them in the first 30 seconds? Um, open it to, obviously, questions, but you're, you're, not, you're leading them down to a point where you, obviously, you want an outcome. From this paper, is there a recommendation to approve? Um, is it just for information? But at the end of the day, I think engaging with the directors so they're part of that decision making process is really important. Um, so you'll obviously have probing questions, different directors will look at it from different perspectives. They will no doubt seen things, seen themes on different boards, they'll be attuned to different risks. But I think the presentation needs to be short, sharp, what are you trying to achieve without um, you know, talking technical language. You want to talk at, at the appropriate, pitch it at the right level. That's what I would, I would sort of say, you know, making sure that you're, um, you know, use slides, use uh, a presentation, a PowerPoint that's, you know, you've got graphs around, you know, where, where value creation is, looking at those sorts of key metrics that are always going to capture the attention of the, particularly the financially literate directors. <laughs> Adele, can I add something on top Please. of that? It's yeah. too soon already to be adding. Yeah. But Jane, I think as well, to add to what you said, the importance of being really clear on the ask when you go to a exactly. board. So it was one of my very early lessons sitting on the board of Hockey Australia. Uh, we had some cultural challenges within our Hockey Roos program at the end of 2020. And the next year we embarked on a really big program to address findings made in a report and, and try and fix that culture. I led the committee that started that work and we were due to present the report to the board. And I took the report as read, but when I went to speak to my fellow directors, I didn't actually have a question for them. So the discussion actually didn't really end up going the way that I wanted it to and I felt kind of flat at the end because I was unclear about what I wanted and as a result, different board members just took it in eight different directions. I think that's an absolutely critical point. At the end of the day, you shouldn't be putting a paper to the board without a recommendation making it really clear, is this a paper for approval and what is it that you're actually asking? Um, because if you're not clear, if you're ambiguous, you will never get what you're after. You'll have a good discussion, but you'll get no resolution. So it's a really valid point, Mary. And with your experiences with boards, Simone, in terms of the written material and being complementary or supporting the oral, represent or the oral presentations, Obviously, you don't want a recitation of what you've just read, so long as it is clear and you know. Because you don't have time. You just no. don't have the time. Mm -hmm. So you want that uh, written material to be background. You're going to have to assume it's read. Most people yeah. will have read it, but, mm -hmm. you know. Just like always. judges read material before we <laughs> yes. um, and, and they're absolutely right. You want a recommendation. You want to put it to it. You also should know the answer to the question that you're, you're exactly. putting. That's actually what you don't want to ask them a question if you don't know the answer. And Good technique with cross-examination. Totally right. You know, it's transparent. Um, but also to sort of look at it and think, well, if you're wanting a discussion, you want to lead it, if there's going to be two options, make it really clear. What are the two options and what are the consequences? Yeah. Um, and it's probably really actually the same, whether you're a government mm. board, a, um, a, you know, one of my clients' boards, or some of the not-for-profits mm -hmm. that I sit on, same with Hockey Roos. Also, there are those... There, there's softer issues like the cultural thing because they're not sort of seen as a deal or a financial thing. 
but they're often quite turbulent. Yeah. So, I mean, some of the boards I've sat on, or that I'm still sitting on, we had um, issues with um, the Sydney Festival and the boycott, which probably none of you noticed because it went under the radar, but for everybody in the arts community, it was like, oh, my God. And uh, that was quite a fascinating thing because there was just arguments left, right and centre. So you could table reports and people would just go off on tangents. And those are the moments you go, hmm, it's really not working. So you have to bring it back if you're presenting someone, if you're something, if you're the lead on that committee, know what you want out of it, guide them to it. Uh, have some questions and be ready with all those answers. And frankly, if there's something really important, go and speak to the people before the yeah, meeting, yeah. right? And even to the point of possibly Dorothy Dixing them a little bit, saying, right, why don't you ask this? Why don't you do that? And then other people who perhaps are not as interested, maybe, or not as invested, will sort of go, oh, okay, that's a fulsome discussion. And you'll get a resolution that is, you know, well, much better. And, much, and, and where everybody is sort of on the same page. Yep. So, but with the oral V written, just make those oral presentations short and snappy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, just lose everyone. Yeah. Cluttered PowerPoint. Yeah. Just <laughs> fall on a heap. You fall in a heap. They just, you know, too many words on the page. Um, you know, lawyers yeah. love words, but that's not how you get the message across clearly. You've got to use visuals. You've got to use diagrams. Yeah pictures, you've got to break it up, that too many words just never work. I think it confuses people as well. Mm. Am I meant to be reading the presentation? Do I need to take exactly. notes or should I be listening to what you're actually saying? Yeah. Precisely, yeah. And it actually takes time to be shorter. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. so take that time and yeah. get up. I think that's right, but it's also that also plays true to um, board papers. It's, you know, you should have a rule of thumb that three pages is usually enough. Maybe yeah. it'll go into four. You can have <coughs> attachments, but... It has to be sharp and pithy and it has to have headings. And again, yeah, that what are you after? Be reasonable in what you're actually looking for. If you're asking for something that's entirely an outlier, you're probably not going to get there. You might have a good discussion again, but you're probably not going to achieve what you're after. Yeah. yeah. You want someone to enjoy the board paper and not sort of look at the get to where's the end. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Very big board packs uh, don't make for yeah, not do the groan when you see 400 pages. That's it, yeah. no pictures. With yeah. no pictures. <laughs> but I think the point you made earlier, Simone, around warming up and having those early discussions before they land in the director's um, inbox is really important. And I think that's a bit of a rule of thumb is that you, obviously you've got a chair who's, you know, very experienced. You're going to run those papers, whether they're through a, a several of the directors who have a key interest in it um, or your chair. And you actually, you bring them along the journey where they're really important decision processes. So that's certainly something that we do in our business. Um, we've also got, you know, shareholders who are ultimate decision makers, boards, the board also being a decision maker, but the interaction there can sometimes be a little grey. Um, but bringing them along the journey is, you know, it makes for lighter work at a board meeting and it makes for your messaging just being much clearer. Yeah. Um, might jump up to Mary, mm -hmm. just in terms of transferable skills now. So you do a lot of podcasting. What do you find useful in terms of preparing your podcast? And what do you find useful in terms of answering questions in podcasts? So we've already actually touched on it a little bit with Jane and Simone, but that idea of preparing the person that you're going to speak to. So we almost do like a pre-interview with them beforehand because a podcast is, we're pretty much doing a podcast right now, right? We're having a conversation amongst people that have an expertise in a particular area. We've all had a little peek at the question, so we sort of know what's coming. But I always like to speak to my guests beforehand, first of all, to be able to pronounce their names correctly. Mm -hmm. And my recommendation is, even if it looks like the name is John Smith, always just double check that it is John Smith because I've made some really awkward and embarrassing mistakes throughout the podcast career. So have that conversation with your guests before they arrive on the show. Show them the questions that you're looking to ask to make sure that if there is a topic that you're touching on that might be a bit uncomfortable for them that they'd prefer not to talk about, that you can sort of iron that out before you have the conversation. And also give them the chance as well to tell you what they want to talk about as well because in the end, the person that I'm speaking to, they're really the star of the show and I want them to shine. So giving them the opportunity to share what's important to them is really key. And I think also in a podcast environment, it is just a general, kind conversation. 
So not to be too firm about the questions that you're asking and to really listen to what the person's saying so that you can ask them a follow-up question or potentially go in a different direction. It's probably one of my favourite things about podcasting in that you don't necessarily just have 40 minutes. You can say we're aiming for between 30 to 45, but if you're having a great conversation and it goes for 55 minutes, that's okay too. Yeah. Um, okay, so Simone, um, we might jump over to you in relation to just some more, to bring it back to the lawyers a little bit. So obviously um, you're regularly, as a lawyer, you're regularly asked questions in conferences about which you have no notice. And you may not know the answer to them um, of the... You didn't get the pre preparation for a podcast, like Mary was yes, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, So what techniques do you find effective in terms of dealing with those questions that you can't answer on the spot? Oh, look, you just have to own it, right? You know, if, you, if it's a technical question and you don't know it, you just... You don't want to just stand there and faff around. You say, look, we're going to have to come back to you on that, full stop. Um, if it's something that's a bit more strategic then, you know, I, I like to think, okay, well, there's actually not a particular answer to this that's like a set one, like, oh, my God, it's section blah, 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 or whatever act or something. But you, um, you know, and I'm in the middle of a transaction right now, which we're hoping to complete at some point, but it's, you know, there's all sorts of bits and pieces coming up, some of which we think are Machiavellian, probably that won't be. But, um, you know, it's sort of looking at the strategy and unpacking it and saying, okay, well, let's come back to first principles. What were we aiming to achieve? What was the other side wanting to do that? And then working through that. So um, I think also because sometimes the questions that are asked by a client in that meeting are more sort of they're speculating, they're thinking, you know, there might be some other agenda. Are they thinking, do they have some financing and something's going to fall down with the financing and do they think there's another deal in the offing and they're wanting to do that? So there could be other reasons. And if you just give them a chance to come out a little bit with more of that, then, you know, then you'll be able to go, oh, actually, that's what you're after. So, and part of it yeah. must be the client directly. Oh, yeah, the absolutely. That must be important again. Yeah, oh, look, totally. And, and, and look, hopefully, you know, you have a good relationship with your client over, over many years so you can, you, you can understand. But there's always, I mean, sometimes as well, because I deal with a lot of German clients, Finnish clients, international clients, um, Sometimes there are surprises because they're coming from some angle about maybe some regulatory aspect in their country or some other internal aspect or sometimes there's even someone on the deal team who's not actually going to be there at the end of the week. And, you know, <laughs> so there's something like that. So, you know, just trying to unpack it, but also knowing when to stop. When to go, oh, actually, there's something we might take that up. <laughs> so, yeah. But it's, a, it's an art and it's actually one of those things where sort of like apropos nothing, but just when you, during COVID, that's a lot harder when people are on Zoom yeah. and you don't have that body language or that ability to read. So mm. I miss that and I, I do encourage that when we talk because it's a deeper relationship. Yeah. And it seems to have continued that. even post-COVID. I don't know yeah. if mm. everybody yeah. else has noticed that, but mm. I was surprised yesterday when I had an in-person meeting and I yeah. <laughs> looked at that until 20 minutes before and I thought, oh, I'll have to be somewhere. That's yeah. so yeah. unusual these days. Yes. But it does change the dynamic. That's right. Jane, in relation to um, stakeholders who you present to now, obviously mm -hmm. this isn't something that you started off in your career. Sure. How have you built up your self-confidence to be able to present to the stakeholders? Yeah, um, look, I think in terms of presenting to different audiences, it obviously comes with, you know, experience. And, you know, I think if I was saying to somebody, you know, building yourself up to present, you know, whether it's to a board or to a, a, a larger audience, start small. Like, obviously, you know, do something that's comfortable to start with. Put yourself into a situation, you know, maybe volunteer for something new that you haven't done. Put Join a committee or, you know, if you do have to present something unexpectedly to the board, do a dry run and, you know, present it to the executive committee um, or, a, or a, you know, a leadership team within the organisation. <laughs> Find a bit of a safe space to start with where you feel comfortable or you, knew, you know the stakeholders. Um, so I think there's, there's no sort of set rules, but I think it's, you know, expose yourself to as many sort of different people and um, organisations as you can. Um, join a, as I said, join a committee. Um, start small. Um, at the end of the day, you know, there's no sort of right or wrong. But, you know, in my last role, I had to do a lot of training and it was a big national operating business and I think getting out there and really meeting 
meeting people in the, you know, whether they're at, you know, ports or at terminals, um, you're really trading the boards and you're meeting people and you're actually, you know, rolling out programs across the business. Mm -hmm. There's nothing better than actually getting to the grassroots or you might one day be, you know, presenting to the leadership team. But at the end of the day, once you know your material, that's a given, you feel confident, you build that up and, you know, I think you, it's a creative really. So, yeah, I think, you know, to the point you, you, you're presenting at boards, again, if you've got that opportunity, sit in a board meeting. I think yeah. see see what it's like, see what those stakeholders are um, like and, you know, how do others present it. I think it's gaining that experience. And, again, when I left private practice, I decided that, you know, qualifying as a company secretary was one way that I could actually gain that experience. And that was a conscious mm -hmm. decision, yeah. you know, it's not... Um, it wasn't that I had this yearning to be a company secretary. It was more around <laughs> having some exposure to the, the decision makers and seeing how it's done. And so that really was a, was a start for me. And um, I think that's, that, that sort of has then sort of built as, um, as I've gone through my career. Yeah. Yeah. I just need to put you in the room. I mean, once that's the room, right. It's, it's exactly. Yeah, have a seat at the table, even if you're not, you know, a contributor to start with. Mm -hmm. You're actually, you're hearing how the decisions are made. You're hearing what a... Um, the hot issues for the business, you, you know where those decisions are being made and how the process works. Yeah. Being in the room, which is an important thing, and this is something that you were saying, Simone, before, but um, being in the room, seeing people is one form of communication. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have different options. We, we can write to people, we can speak to people, we can sometimes pick up the phone. Yeah. Oh, you're the old Which some, some people <laughs> just don't know how to pick up the phone. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, some of the juniors that I work with are sort of like, oh, here's a, you know, three-page email. I've been like, oh, let's just be three on one right now <laughs> and get to the point. And then often, uh, often they're mo it's not, not always a misunderstanding it, it, at all. It's more just, oh, that's what you really meant. Right? Yeah. So... And things can get lost in translation. Very much. True. And it's sort of, um, there's a warmth in your voice or, a, you know, something that's a little bit more understandable. Um, um, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know, it's just also tedious sort of being hit by people with their anger. It's too, yes, it's and being buried. Buried in it, yeah. And a little rapport as well. Totally. Yeah, Say, exactly. hi, how are you? Totally. How's this? How's that project going? How's yeah. this person? How is that on the weekend? Yeah, exactly. And yeah. building that deeper connection with people. Yeah. yeah, and also you find that, you know, with especially clients you're working with till late at night or through all sorts of things, there's, there's personal things going on for them. And, yeah. you know, if you can figure out something, oh, right, so you've got your sister's wedding tomorrow, okay, so you really need this document tonight. Okay, <laughs> that's fine, get it done. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it's just those little things that yeah. people then appreciate yeah. and it all just builds up in that relationship. So then, you know, if they're a bit stickier as a client and things like yeah. that or if they then move off to another company, they'll remember your kindness to them usually and they'll come back. So, But it's it's just basic human connection, yeah. I think, people. Yeah. And also it's a trust factor. Yeah. You know, if you're not in the room personally and seeing someone's body language, then at least if you're on the phone you've got a voice you know, you can cut a bit more quickly to the issue. You yeah. can hear if they're getting a bit pissed off or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't have to wade yeah. through a turgid email, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, not that email should be, you know. If you can just, I, my rule is if it can just be in the screen <laughs> with the next steps, what do you do? Bang on, perfect, fine. Obviously, there's a bit of ass covering that sometimes you want to do that. But, you know, if you've had that conversation and you can just encapsulate it. The recommendation at the top, and yeah, then if you want absolutely. to read on. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Summary. Boom. Straight in. Yeah. I got taught if you have to scroll, it's oh, too long. <laughs> <laughs> scrolling aloud. Yeah, yes, no reading beyond that. <laughs> First page. But you're right, like the human connection is really important because I think even with internal stakeholders, yeah. um, too many sort of emails, you you get those shouty emails, you, you yeah. lose it, and it's like pick the phone up. You'll sort that out within five minutes. It's not that hard. It's have the human connection. It's, you know, even if it is on a Zoom screen or a team screen, it's much better than just emailing. The analogy yeah. that I like to think about is it's like marbles in a jar. So every time you have a positive interaction with someone, it's like putting mm -hmm. a marble right. in a jar or a lolly in a jar. And then when yeah. things go wrong, you yeah. need to take a lolly exactly. out, but you always still want Something. candy in the jar, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Very good point, Erin. Yeah. Absolutely, because yeah. you never know, because it's those relationships that will help you at a future point in time it's like when you've got to pull something together really urgent it's those people that you can pick the phone up and they will be the ones that will help right. you and they will 
help you? It's and not also even a if question. You, if there's been a mistake or something that you haven't done as brilliantly as you should have along the way, yep. if you've got that rapport, there's far more likely to be like, oh, okay, look, hang on, you're up till one o'clock in the morning. Like, well, you didn't see that little <laughs> part. That's okay. Um, I mean, obviously, you're trying to be perfect all the time, but you, you, can, you can't be. That's, yeah, right. that's right. So if there's that rapport, there's far more likely to be a little bit of yeah. you know, cutting a bit of slack for that. Just putting on that, so you talked about Jane about human connection. So Mary, obviously you have to deal with interviews and your podcasting. So what techniques do you find as useful in drawing out information from someone who might be a closed book, for example? I assume you don't get many of those on your podcast. But if there was someone, how do you draw it out and how do you use that in exchange of how is that skill transferred? I think it's asking the right type of questions, like we were talking about when we're dealing with boards. So there are a couple of standard questions or standard starts to question that I sort of have in my back pocket that I always use when I'm trying to draw a story out. So words like, tell me more about that. Um, that is always really helpful because it's not a closed question. It's a beautiful open question and then gives the person that you're speaking to the opportunity to tell you more. Something that I have definitely struggled with over my time though is um, I'm the sort of person that gets really excited sometimes and likes to interrupt people. Um, <laughs> holding my breath and writing down the next yeah. question or keeping it really clear in my head is something that I've also had to work on because there's nothing worse than someone speaking. I've interrupted you I think as well oh. tonight already, Simone. <laughs> there's nothing worse than speaking and then someone just pops another idea in and you go off on another tangent. Sometimes that can be beautiful, but sometimes as well it can be extremely disruptive. Um, I think as well listening, I, I know it sounds really simple, but sometimes it's really, really tricky. So sometimes when I'm podcasting or I'm doing something with the business, you've got a list of questions that you want to get through. You've got half an hour and you want to make sure you get through all those questions. Sometimes that actually prevents you from listening to what the person is telling you. And sometimes there are really useful nuggets of information and you can go on that tangent and ask a different question. Don't be so wedded to your structure that it prevents you from asking the right questions and giving the person that you're speaking to the opportunity to tell you what you're looking for. Um, jumping over then, we dealt a bit with um, oral communication. So Simone, if we jump over then to written communications. Um, what do you find useful? We, we spoke briefly about lengthy emails, but lengthy documents can be even worse because they go much longer than the scrolling. Um, so what do you find useful in a lengthy document to really get to the point? Um, look, I think also <coughs> just over the last few years, people's attention spans are just less and less. So when you've got an ideal with lots of share sale agreements, business sale agreements, 50 million page agreements, whatever, um, uh, you, you do really need to bring it down to some key issues to, to, to sell. And every client's different. Some love it, love going through every single line. Not many, but a few. Uh, um, but, you know, you have to look for the key points that you need to get across, first of all, and make sure that all those key terms are in there and that the client's happy with it. There's not... There's not really, are there sort of like... You know, 50 million different issues. It often will come down to, you know, I don't want to pick too many numbers out, but it could be two or three issues that are really important, you know, what's being sold and is exactly right, where's the money coming from or how is it going to be paid, what are your, you know, one of my open-ended questions, uh, you know, well, what's going to keep you up at night about this? Mm -hmm. And that usually elicits something going, oh, well, actually, I'm worried about the performance of this or I'm worried about the fact that I'm buying a company and I think I'm paying too much money, but that's the deal and I'm just worried about... You know, are we going to get the sort of sales at the end of it? So uh, try to at least focus on that. And then also just being frank with them and sort of discussing, look, we're going to have standard provisions about these particular things. Do you want to walk through them or not? You know, up to them, hopefully perhaps a little bit. Um, <laughs> and, and then sometimes you will just have three-hour meetings where you say to them up front, we have lots of coffee, we've got lots of pastries, we're going to sit down and we're going to get through <laughs> it. And it's going to be... Awful, and it's going to be like <laughs> uh, having some operation, but um, but it's needed. So just prepare them for it, and then stick to that um, agenda and, and and get through it. And then turn the document around quickly after that, so that they feel that you know you haven't wasted their time and it's taking forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's basically what I think will work. If I can just jump in there, I would say um, in terms of I guess advices. Um, you know, an executive summary is 
is key. Mm -hmm. um, I know in our business, you know, if you don't have that good upfront executive summary and recommendation, people just won't read beyond it. Like the lawyers will read beyond it, will read all of the detail, but you'll lose the business. And that is, it's almost like that is the, the most important part of the whole document because, mm -hmm. you know, you won't get a lot of attention beyond that. And so it's like how, and crafting a really good executive summary um, is difficult. It's not, it's not, you know, it's, it's often the last thing you're going to put together, but it's really critical. Do you find also, Jane, sometimes that, mm. you know, you'll, you, sometimes it is quite nice to have like, it, all the technical stuff in an attachment. Yeah, exactly. So the cover letter yeah. is just really, here's Absolutely. the executive summary. We know you're yeah. not going to look at the attachment. Yes. Here's your option A, here's yeah. your option B, here are your consequences, yeah. bingo. And that's often what we will yeah. tell our, uh, you know, uh, not tell, uh, suggest <laughs> to our advisors that it is a, a way to deal with it. It's like you've got that detailed analysis as backup, which is obviously yeah. needed, but you've got a nice, crisp, one-and-a-half-page letter, and that's all that will get read by, you know, the most the CEO or the executives, that's really the takeaway. Um, I think, so. Jane, for me, that was one of the hardest parts of moving mm. from a, a law firm yes. into working in-house. Like when you're in the law firm, it's all about those beautiful technical long mm. advices mm. and making sure that the double spaces are there and the full <laughs> stops are perfect. You know, they get yeah. the red marker out and yeah. <laughs> circle every, every mistake, whereas yeah, when you're in-house, it trains you beautifully for in-house. When you're in-house, it's about... Yeah getting them the answer, getting it quickly, and it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. Exactly. That's right. Speed is obviously important. You want it to be right, mm. but brevity is really important because you lose people's attention pretty quickly. And if you can't just say it in a handful of sentences, it's like, just tell me the answer. That's all I want to know. What's the answer? <laughs> so, yeah. But to get there in terms of the executive summary, you do need to understand your client to understand your business almost intimately. Mm. So as a policy advisor, Mary, how have you gone about understanding parts of the business? It's a really good question, Adele, because I started at the Commonwealth Bank on June 21st, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that I remember that date so specifically is because it was the week that things sort of started going bad in Sydney again in terms of COVID. So I started a week before we went into our second lockdown. So it was a new organisation, 50,000 people work at <coughs> Commonwealth Bank, and it was extremely difficult in those first six months to get an understanding of what the business looked like and how all the different pieces fit together whilst trying to learn new systems and documents and controls. But Adele, I honestly find that talking to people has been yeah. the best way to get to know them, yeah. to understand their challenges and to understand their teams. I've had a lot of coffee, I've had a lot of Zooms, I've had a lot of Teams conversations. But as well, I think one thing that ComBank is really good at is we do lunch and learn sessions. So I go to as many of those as possible, even if they're not directly in my remit, because you usually find that you get at least one thread that is useful to help you sort of put together how the business works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Jane, as part of your role as in-house, as general counsel, um, you often have to understand parts of the business, but you need to yeah. acquire that information sometimes incredibly quickly. Yeah. So absent having the long lunches <laughs> that sometimes you can do, how do you go about getting that information yeah. quickly? Yeah, I think it, it, it's related to what Mary was saying. It's, again building the relationships, understanding what the key drivers of the business are, um, really having that sort of background. And often, you know, when I moved from private practice into a listed company, it probably took me a good six months to mm. really understand what the business drivers are. And it's often about, it's just as much about the who as the actual what. And you've really got to know people and get to know them. And they're the people that are going to be critical to helping you, being able to answer questions quickly. Because... They're not always legal questions. Yes, they'll have a legal implication, but you've got to gather information and you've got to do it quickly. So, one, you're drawing on your relationships that you've built yeah. um, and, two, knowing who to call, knowing who to pull together to help you get there because it's not just, you know, a simple in a vacuum answer to a legal question. It's you've got to understand all those commercial drivers as well as the strategic drivers. So you could pick up the, you know, the, the business's strategic plan and read that, but it might not 
make a whole lot of sense without understanding how all the different pieces fit together. So I think it's talking to people and building the relationships that will really help you in the long run pull everything together in a really short time. So if I was, you know, having to advise on something in a really quick period of time, I would make, make some calls, sit down, have those discussions really quickly. That will help me get there. Jane, yeah. usually even if you don't know the right person, yeah. someone in that sphere exactly. of influence, you can pick up the phone and say, hey, yeah. Simone, I've yeah. yeah. got this really tricky question. Yeah. Yeah. Who, should, yeah. I who to? should I speak to? Yeah. Can you direct me in the right way? Yeah. And it's also important, I find, you know, not in that similar position, but also just asking, well, what's the other side? What, mm -hmm. what are you, you know, what are you concerned about? What, how's other people going to react to that? Because you're only giving one side. And obviously yeah. in a business, it's yeah. the side that you want. But if it's... You know, with the client, obviously, they're telling me what they want. But I want to know, what are we going to be met with? What sort of arguments? What are you worried about? Because I'd like to preempt them. If any of them are good, can we just interrogate that first? Because I don't want to waste time if there's actually something that we go, oh, let's just agree to that. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And, you know, what do we really want? Yeah. Let's concentrate on that. Well, that's the right question, I think, Simone. Mm. Sometimes people have a very clear idea of how they want to get where they're going. But if you understand the outcome, then yeah. you can say to them, yeah. Well, if that's the outcome, we can go this way mm -hmm. or we can go that way. It doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be yeah. Yeah. that line that they're thinking, right? And that's yeah. how you think strategically. Yes. Let's get yes. to that outcome. Yeah. Yeah. It might not be the yeah. way you thought we would, but mm. let's get yeah. to that outcome. Yeah. Um, and just wrapping up the issue of communication, communicating and communication techniques, Simone, you're obviously working in international mergers and acquisitions. What do you find is working well in terms of communication by Australian lawyers? And what should we be adopting in terms of international lawyers and what they're doing well? Uh, look, I mean, we certainly hold our own in the in the world. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, look, um, I deal with a lot of uh, lawyers in a lot of different um, jurisdictions. Uh, I'm always impressed. I mean, I can speak fluent German, but I'm always impressed by their English is fantastic and and, and really um, quite extraordinary. Um, oh, look, there's always some. Um, you do need to explain any sort of local nuances quite carefully, but um, if they're in if they're in house internationally, they're usually quite remarkable. They've you know Australia's only one jurisdiction. They're dealing with something in Mexico and something in Germany and something in France. So you know most of the people I've dealt with have picked up all sorts of things over the years. So. Um, there are always a few little things. I mean, I know a few peculiarities compared to Germany and Australia, so it's always, you know, helpful, possibly a bit show-offy maybe, um, just to sort of say, hey, what about this? Um, but, you know, you've got to have something at 2am, don't you? Um, but, um, uh, you know, I deal with a lot of um, Finnish clients who are, you know, I, I just find all the Scandinavian countries are just um, remarkable in their breadth of knowledge of things. So we often do that. We always do that by phone, though. There's, you know, I mean, some emails go back and forward, but um, the phone calls are great because you can really tell instantly and or on Zoom, whatever, um, that um, what's important or what's something they go, yeah, know that, been there, done that, forget about that. I know you think that's important. We don't give it a crap as a business. This is what we want. Okay. Go, great, cut through, terrific. Save legal fees, save time. We can all go and have dinner. Yeah. So um, go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. Go to bed. <laughs> Sleep wins. Yeah. So um, look, I don't think there's anything you know. I mean, that's um, particularly different that we do. Most law firms that deal with um, international lawyers have usually got a, a pretty good rapport. Um, and I guess we're all often we're trying to achieve the same thing. And so, I mean, in, in in a corporate world, we're not. It's not ad, you know. There's not a, a litigation, hopefully, on foot. Um, so often the outcome is the same, but we're coming at it from different angles. So I'm a big believer in if your client has to end up dealing with the other side in a joint venture, don't crap on it. You know, just <laughs> just keep it nice and good. Get get what they need, obviously, but bear in mind that. It's a bit like a pregnancy, like you go, oh, my God, it's actually the bit after the raising of the child. That's that's bigger. So don't make that such a trauma for your um, client going forward because of sort of your behaviour earlier on. So Good advice. There you go. Um, jumping back to you then, Jane, uh, we often hear the term commercial risk, and we, we all hear this a lot from our clients, um, commercially minded, a lot of commercial outcome. Yeah. What, what are we actually talking about? Yeah, I think, again, it probably lends itself back to what I was talking about earlier. It's understanding what the 
the strategy of the business is. What are the what what is the what are those um, uh, strategic goals? What what what's the business's risk appetite? Um, understanding uh, where what the values are. I think it, it really goes to that. And I mean, you're understanding what those parameters and they obviously inform your decision making. Um, but I think also understanding where the decision making occurs. What are the you know is it is it at a shareholder level? Is it at a at a board level, understanding, you know, can management make that decision? Is it the CEO? I think they're all obviously important. They, but, you know, if you, if obviously if you're in a, you know, a legal transaction, setting that sort of risk appetite, um, you know, not necessarily setting it, but understanding what you can and can't do is obviously informed by the businesses. Um, you know, for, in, in our case, we've got policy objectives that are set by the Australian government. Um, they're obviously our guiding principles. Um, and then there's then there's more the strategic plan about how we actually get there. Um, but that commercial risk profile sometimes it's a bit of a um, you know it's a bit of a feel. You you know what you you know what the parameters are, and other times there'll be set hard dollar values there. Um, you know one rule of thumb when I'm talking to you know our counterparties is you know the Commonwealth doesn't give indemnities like that's just a no go. Um, so, you know, don't keep asking, um, don't go and negotiate um, with third parties and think that, you know, that you're going to get the Commonwealth to sign up to that. That's just, it doesn't go. I mean, it's not quite the case. Yes, they can give indemnities, but it's a very, um, it, it's a complex process because mm -hmm. ultimately it's looked at as a contingent liability and it sits on their balance sheet. So to go through that process is incredibly um, time consuming and complex and not something that you really take, tread lightly on. So we do have that sort of um, guiding principle about no indemnities. And as a government-owned entity, we similarly have that same sort of principle. So it's um, informing, I guess, the people that, you, you, that you're negotiating with or you're working with. That's, you know, something that is a fairly basic thing. But, yeah, so I think it's really, I mean, some, you know, I've worked in with, with construction companies that have very strict and... Um, um, stringent risk profiles that they write down, um, that's not always the case. I think, you know, you're looking at your, your strategic objectives and um, that really informs your risks and um, how you go about making decisions and um, negotiating, I think. Yeah. Um, turning to support networks, this is one thing that we find not just in in-house but particularly with, with law firms um, and, and we do need to start somewhere. Um, speaking barristers as, as junior lawyers and as the lead partner um, in the corporate CBP, um, what do you find is important to put into place for junior lawyers so that they can start to grow? Oh, there's a myriad of things, but I think if they, uh, you know, I always encourage you, come in on every phone conversation. I want you to hear it. We might not build your time for it, right, because you're not necessarily adding food to it, uh, to something, but... I want you to hear how the, the, the conversation goes. See where we're going. Is it is it a, a single issue conversation? Are we going to run through our whole things? And then what's the outcome, right? We've, we've had that conversation. Where do we go to next? How are we going to move this issue along? And then track it. I always say to the juniors, you know, the most, the most important thing you can do is be across a lot of the detail. Um, be the one that's able to say when the date was, when the option's got to be exercised, when the lease was entered into. Um, all of those sort of things, get to know all those things because that's that's a bit of rote learning and, you know, reading up and understanding. It's not necessarily... I'm never going to say to them, so what do you think? Should we, should we tell the client whether or not to do this transaction? <laughs> but what's important is I want them to hear then, um, you know, as I said before, this transaction I'm doing at the moment, that we're undergoing these really bizarre twists and turns. So I've got two people assisting me, juniors, and I'm just saying to them, okay, so... Where do you think this one's going to go? Now that you've seen what's happening. And so that excites them because yeah. that feels like they're inching a bit closer to a seat at the table. Yeah. So I want them to see how that goes and say, your biggest value as you get on will be judgment, right? So you're not going to be swept off by AI. You're going to be someone where the client's going to go, I need judgment here. I need someone to give me that value. The only person that can do that, um, and I hope I, AI never gets there, but that sort of thinking of that process and the why and, well, what if we did this and um, and the strategic planning that goes into that. Um, so if you can give your juniors that assistance to build up on that and then 
you know, hopefully they perform really well in that. So you trust yeah. them. It's just a matter of trust. You say, great, you were able to pull out all those things. And I've always tried as well, um, the younger men in the room don't seem to have any issue with it, but um, certainly with women, with, uh, you know, younger women over the years, I've said, look, we're going into the meeting now and I'd like you, when I call on you to say, oh, look, um, you know, Mary, can you address this or, you know, whomever, um, uh, you're across this issue to... So that person... Yeah then feels as a junior solicitor, yeah. I'm valuable in this meeting, I've got it. something to say, the yeah. client doesn't just sit, um, sit, think I'm just sitting there writing notes, um, and I've got something to say. So they can prep for that one particular thing. And then as, as it goes, you know, as they get more experience, they can interject and say, you know, here's something else um, that's of value, or oh, what about this thought? Um, and I think that's an important... Uh, way of training people. I mean, as lawyers, we're here also to teach. Yeah. You know, that's really important. You can't get good juniors, well, I'm assuming whether it's baby barristers, baby corporate lawyers, whatever, um, you know, you, you've got to help train people and give them that confidence so that they can deliver you a, as fantastic a piece of work with a great executive summary <laughs> and, and know that that's what, you know, what to, so that your job as a partner is to sort of go, my goodness, this is fantastic. I can literally sign it. Because yeah. your other job is to go in and yeah. bloody win business. Yeah. So you've got to be doing that. You can't necessarily always be... You know, it's not a great use of your time if you're always having to redo stuff and that does happen. And then you've got to say to yourself, well, did I give proper instructions? Maybe not. Maybe I've got to go and think again. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's a fairly simple, but, you know, it's happened for years, life cycle... Yeah. Um, but to give people that confidence, and it's absolutely wonderful for when you when you start to see people that that start to cross over the line from yeah I've learnt all the least stuff I can give you all of that, but now they're saying oh, but what if the client did this and you're like oh that's good, yeah. and then to allow them as well, or, yeah. or at least if you're talking to the client, make sure you credit them. You know, Mary had a great idea, blah blah blah. You then look a bit more generous. I see that too often. Like oh well, you know, own that idea as well. Bring that person in. Let that person feel, you know, wow, I'm 12 foot tall. I've yeah. contributed a great idea. Fantastic. Because what are they going to do? Contribute another good idea. Yes. So that's how you do it. And the client then says, oh, good, there's a depth, mm. right? So if someone got hit by a bus, there's someone else there to, to help as well, <laughs> you know? So I, I think that's an important thing yeah. to, you know, to trust. Yeah. And if anyone wants to dig deeper on that, have a chat to Simone when we have drinks afterwards because she talks the talk but she walks the walk as well. Um, I was one of Simone's genius a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah, last year. It's <laughs> <laughs> so 21, aren't we? <laughs> and in giving the, the breath to the junior lawyers to be able to have the confidence to, to step up in meetings or, or, or to suggest certain things in respect of advices or mm. stories, whatever it might be, what other... Um, skills or observations have you learned from or, or seen from the junior lawyers that you think that that is apt, that, that they're going to go on and grow um, from these experiences? Oh, look, if, it, um, if I see them start to... Well, I love it if someone says, oh, look, has this been done before? Great. Have another look. It's not... Re you know, if you don't have to reinvent the wheel, have a look, see what other... What other advices have we sent out to the client in that yeah. matter? Great. See what's been presented. Has the client reacted well? Um, also then, you know, stop and say to yourself, and, and you should do this whatever level you're at, what are we trying to achieve by this? Because too often you can just sort of rush in and get something out. Um, if you can just pause, and it's to your restraint thing in a podcast as well, you just stop and go, okay, what is the aim of this? How am I going to present that in a concise format? And what do I want about it? Right back to our quest conversation on the board paper. What do I want to see from it? Yeah. And and once a junior... And, and tell the junior what you're doing as well, the junior lawyers that are working with you, um, so that they can go back and sit at their desk. And sometimes they're scared shitless. I know I was sort of like, mm -hmm. well, I don't know, it seems overwhelming. But if you can just pause for a minute and say, OK, I have been told what this whole transaction is about. I have been told what my areas, which might be the due diligence report. And now I now know that my report is going to feed in to the risks that are going to be analysed in the share sale or the business sale or whatever we're doing. So I can see that if I weren't to identify a risk, then that's not going to be covered. If that's not covered, then the client's going to buy or sell or something and that risk won't be accounted for. 
Okay, so I can track right back to the stuff I'm doing to make sure that I do the best job. And if I have any question or I don't understand, I'll put my hand up and ask. If you can get people to see that they're not, yeah, they are a cog, but they're an important cog, yeah. and how that cog is in yeah. Yeah. crucial to the whole pathway and success, yeah. then they will feel part of it. And like anything, yeah. they'll grow and, you yeah. know, they'll go, oh, yeah. give, me, think, give me more. Yeah, I think having that sort of tangible, be, and that's part of the learning, is having that sort of tangible, um, you know, understanding of what you're contributing towards yeah. and why that's important to the client. I think they're the sorts of things you can't, you're not going to learn that at law school. You're not going to learn that really in a CPD on them that we're talking about these things here. Ask they're questions. not written down, but they're the sorts of valuable learnings that yeah. you'll get, you know, whether you're on a secondment or from, yep. a, from a generous mentor. Yeah. They're the sorts of untapped, I think, skills that you do need to build to really add that extra value, whether you're an in-house lawyer or you're a private practice lawyer. Um, they're the sorts of bits that are going to really make a difference because how do you get in under those sort of, you know, important pieces um, for decision-making? Um, what makes that client tick? Where, what are their priorities? And it's not to say that they're certainly not cookie-cutter. You certainly can't apply it to everyone. You've got to understand. But it's asking the right questions and having that exposure, I think, is, is, is valuable. So being able to bring your, you know, your junior lawyers with you or jump on and do a secondment. They're great skills to learn and um, hopefully things that you'll take through your whole career. Um, if we change over now to uh, no, next topic, which is in relation to networking and marketing, and Mary, I think you've got to be the expert on this because <laughs> maybe <laughs> we look at your LinkedIn profile and the photos that are on there weekly, I feel, are just, <laughs> just incessant. Um, so <laughs> what has been your approach to networking? What works and what are your tips for those to get into the formal, the more formal side of networking. Right. All right, first thing I have to say, I hate that word so much, <laughs> networking. It just makes me feel really icky, it makes it feel very transactional. So I like to think of it as making new friends. Um, I've gotten better over the years. So when I first started writing and sort of working with the NRL, I'd go into a room, I'd look around and I knew no one. I was like, oh, what am I going to do? I don't know anyone. So... These are my top tips and we're all going to practice tonight. <laughs> so no doubt many of you will have come with a friend and your inclination will be to walk over there and speak with your friend about what Jane, Simone and I have spoken about tonight. I'd encourage you to try and speak to someone else. If you see someone standing alone, invite them into your conversation. And if you are by yourself, don't be afraid to walk up to someone and join their circle. I know that can feel a little bit scary, but I've never walked up to a circle, asked to be included, and be said, no, sorry. <laughs> and if they do say no, sorry, then you've actually done yourself a favour because that's not a circle that you're no. writing. <laughs> so there are some of my very basic tips. My other tip is if you take someone's business card or their phone number, I'm not really sure how we do it these days. No. It used to be business cards, not anymore. Just reach out to them the next day to say hello. Yeah. It's literally, hi, Simone. Mm. It was really great to meet you yeah. last night. I enjoyed speaking about this. Yeah. Look forward to staying in touch. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully Simone will come back to me and say, hi, Mary, it was great to meet you too. Let's yeah. have a coffee or yeah. let's keep yeah. in touch. And then I've met Simone. Yeah. Yeah. Her contact details are in my phone. And if I yeah. need something or if yes. Simone needs something from me, then we've got a really, really good basis to start building that yes. relationship. And people always want to help. They like do. People really genuinely do. want to help, whether it's friends of mine say, oh, my daughter wants to study law, can you talk her out of it? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, actually, that and that is a real one, because recently a friend of mine um, said to me, oh, my daughter, girl's, daughter's doing a... Um, I won't name the firm. But, uh, <laughs> and, and she's doing a grand rotation, and she's loving tech. And the father was like, oh. and, and so I went and spoke to her and I said, okay, so your father's really worried you're doing tax. And um, anyway, we got to the bottom and, and she actually loves it. And so I talked to her about all the people I know who are tax lawyers, how happy they are, some who aren't, but who've done other things. And it was funny because the, I'd met the father through various connections and, um, but it wasn't huge, but it, exactly like it was that. just enough, had a, right? Just enough. And he was so thrilled that someone had... You know, not even being a tax lawyer, but um, knowing a lot of tax lawyers. 
Um, and I just think you're right, people do want to help. Um, and even if that's just a little interaction, you feel nice. You they do. feel nice. Yeah. And there's just a little bit yeah. of more, yeah. you know, calm around the world. People ask me all the time, how did you meet that mm -hmm. person? Or how did you interview that person? I ask them. <laughs> it's really as simple as that. And the only thing that can get hurt in that situation is your pride. And if they don't come back or they say, sorry, I'm really busy, then that is absolutely okay. And you're right, Simone, people do love to help. Yeah. People reach out to me on LinkedIn sometimes. Yeah. Can you talk to my daughter? She really wants to work in rugby league. I don't yeah. actually work in rugby league, but sure, I'll have a conversation yeah. with your daughter <laughs> and tell her what I know and maybe it's the tax work yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We'll all have the tax lawyer conversations, yeah. have we? Yeah. So let's all practice later, okay? We'll I'm not just going to stand with Simone yeah. and yeah. Jane <laughs> in a little circle. We don't keep closed in so you can't join us. Say no to anyone that tries yeah, to come no, and join yeah. us. Um, uh, and so building on that, Simone, how do you, you're obviously a busy partner at a law firm, how do you focus your energy, how do you focus your efforts on effective, useful, I don't want to use the word networking, but oh. I don't know anything else, so. Connection. Well, yeah, Connection. yeah look, I mean, you, you sometimes you don't really know. I mean, it depends. If you're thinking, right, well, I'm going to give a, um, a presentation with a bunch of, um, you know, experts in somewhere and I'm hoping to get some work off it, um, you know, sometimes that's a bit of luck. Sometimes that's just sowing a few seeds. Sometimes that's just increasing your profile, I suppose, in an industry sector where people sort of say, oh, well, she talked about that, you know, recent discussions that I've had on... ESG, we've run a director series and people are like, oh, that's good. Um, so uh, sometimes work comes off that, sometimes it doesn't. I, I, I guess I don't, I don't really, I'm probably a bit more like you. I don't sort of go in and sort of think, oh, yeah, I need to get X, Y, Z bits of work. I, I just think if you go in with an open heart and there's a bit of energy and excitement about something you're happy to, to talk about, then usually good things will come of that and that's enough. And if, if it's not work as such or paid work or whatever, that's fine. It's totally fine because, you know, you might go to something and you, you're hoping someone will do the same for you. So, you know, it's it doesn't have to be that mm. transactional. There mm. is much more the sort of opportunity to have friends or, you know, I don't know, there could be other aspects. I mean, I'm involved a lot in the arts. So people often say, oh, look, um, I've been very interested in Griffin Theatre Company. Can you tell me more? Well, that's going to make me super excited and, you know, that doesn't mean there's another, you know, another client coming in, but, you know, you've, you've made a bit of a difference to uh, the world, hopefully, in a small way. Mm. Yeah. Just to build on um, building relationships with people, and as you said, it is sort of introducing yourself to the group. Um, but sometimes that can be difficult for people, particularly whether it be taking that first step, but also self-promotion. Mm -hmm. And this is maybe sometimes another word that necessarily people don't want to use and feel a little bit uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So in terms of self-promotion, how, Simone, have you gone about it, particularly in your various roles that you've had? Mm. Well, look, often in a legal context, I mean, you know, there's, um, there's certainly speaking opportunities that you can do and then you know if you really are thinking well I'm using this speaking opportunity to hopefully win some more business then you've really got to go and talk afterwards to people and 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 um and spend a bit of time and then you know I mean I recently spoke at a, a at a um at an event actually for for a friend who uh, was former chair of an organization I was on and has now moved into a sort of industry sector and um and after chatting with some people there, um, it's not the one you were at, actually. It's a different one. Um, <laughs> just, just while you're thinking. Um, but several people came up and emailed. You know, I'd left some business cards because they'd asked me to. I wasn't going to do that. And then um, they've emailed back and said, oh, look, can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? And the particular matters were not actually corporate. One well, was an employment law matter, which I gave to my employment law colleague who immediately responded, and then another to an IP colleague. So, look, a little bit about that is... is I guess trying to be relaxed, and I know it is easier if you're an extroverted person. I mean, yeah. I perversely get a little bit excited if I'm going to a fun home. Oh, I don't know one, but I bet there might be someone. I mean, I actually get a little bit excited. That's quite sad, really. But many people go, I know no one, yeah. and I'm going to feel awful, and it's terrible. And um, and I think, yeah, I suppose it's just being a little bit brave, and also realizing that there's probably half a dozen people in the room or more who also feel same the same. same. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. 
you give it a go, you have a chat. Um, you know, I mean, if it's if it's seriously about trying to win more business, then usually, I mean, most law firms have a bit more of a structure and you'll be doing tenders and coffees. Yeah. And, um, and I mean, you know, some of the obvious is you'll have bigger clients perhaps in other sections and they might be running a big construction matter or something and they'll say, oh, look, come along and make Simone, she's doing this corporate work. So that's a bit more of a low hung fruit as it were yeah. um, and that's sometimes an easier in um, so you've got structures that help you with that but if you're doing it on your own a bit more um, then it is through potentially speaking opportunities or um, or just other you know smaller coffee sometimes you know exactly as you've done yeah. sort of having one-on-ones and, and seeing where that happens <coughs> you know? and I think in the sort of the in-house sort of environment joining like an industry mm. body or a committee, even if it's not for a speaking engagement, yeah. joining yeah. something that you can actually contribute, like it's something they might have a topic that you're really interested in, it might bring something back to the to your work um, that you can actually really add some value, but you're actually contributing. You're, you know, whether it's a, you know, a legislative review committee or something yeah. really exciting, you know. It's, I guess it's like finding <laughs> those it's opportunities. Exciting, might be yeah, that's too. right. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite right. But um, finding something that, I guess, you feel comfortable doing because, you know, yeah, as Simone yeah, said, yeah. not everyone's going to be looking for speaking engagements. Oh, that yeah. might not be your comfortable yeah. zone. But, you know, there's lots of things that you can join. And I, I don't think I'm speaking out of school when you say, you, you mentioned before, you, you have circles in, in in-house in friends who will assist if there's sort of a... Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Or that? Yeah, so in the... Um, it's quite mm. right. It's actually in the government business enterprise circle. We have, so the, you know, whether it's NPN, ARTC, Snowy... Yeah. Um, we have a bit of a community of practice, and I think this um, is really helpful. You know, we've, I was actually just on a session this afternoon about the new, um, the National um, Crime Commission that's, um, they've just announced today the appointments um, to that body, um, the Federal National Crime Committee, um, Commission, I should say. And we had a bit, there was a bit of a presentation, but there's work that's going to come out of that. And so we'll reach out to our fellow colleagues across those organisations and say, hey, what are you doing? What do you think about this? Have you ever done this? And so that's really valuable, but it's a network. Mm -hmm. um, you're very comfortable picking the phone up. Um, sometimes we'll jo do something jointly. Um, but it's, yeah, I think just, again, networking and building the personal relationships is what it's about. Yeah, yeah. I think just on self-promotion as well, and I, I do this too much, potentially. I, do, I tell everyone what I am doing all the time to the point that people come up to me and have a conversation with me. I'm not sure if I've met them before, but they've seen my LinkedIn or something. Don't be afraid to tell people what you're up to. It's not self-promotion if you're passionate about it. It's totally okay. I'm going to get a photo with Simone tonight and with Jane and say, hey, wasn't it awesome to go here and talk about this with this amazing group of people? Do not be afraid to do it. And also don't be afraid to put yourself forward for those opportunities for the award, for the scholarship, for the course, whatever, do it because you've really got nothing to lose. And if I'm being super honest, that's how I started with my Ladies Who League. Um, Simone actually told me that I had nothing to lose when I told her that I didn't want to do it because I was scared. Simone said, no, go home and think about it. And the next day I started a really crappy blog. And here I am 10 years later <laughs> sitting next to Simone, here full circle. So all of you go out there and, and do what you want to do and don't be afraid to put yourselves out there because um, you're all talented, capable, wonderful individuals and have something to contribute. So don't be afraid to. Go forth. Yeah. <laughs> and before we go forth and put into place all of the suggestions in yeah. networking, does anyone have any questions now for our panel before? No. Someone must. Someone Just must. something, anything. Someone online. We've got a number of people watching online. In Especially Houston. Mary's podcast. Yeah. Thanks. No, yes, we've got a hand. Um, thanks so much for the uh, discussion. Um, one of the themes I've, I've sort of found that you all talked about is knowing your client in doing any sort of interaction. As a junior lawyer, um, in any sort of situation, I suppose like external, um, you know, being an external counsel um, as opposed to internal, but uh, in any situation, what are some of the ways you could learn day to day? There's what niche networking means, like that's one of the things that you can easily do, but what are some of the other ways you can learn the inside outs of your client? 
So you're you're speaking from an inter from an internal uh, from a lawyer in a private practice situation. Correct. Yeah. Um, look, I think what's great for junior lawyers is to actually um, try and link up with someone who's a, at a similar level in the client mm -hmm. yeah. because part of life is also just sort of getting older and the more you get older and more friends have more important yeah. jobs. It's pretty bizarre. <laughs> <I'm just going laughs> I don't think I knew them at uni. Um, it's and, scary. Yeah, it's very scary. So you could, and I mean, God, any partner's going to go absolutely you know, excited through the roof if you said, oh, look, you know, I'd really like to organise a session with some of the two ICs, the three ICs, whatever, someone else who's a little bit lower in the seniority um, and ask them what their issues are. Now, that's just the most fantastic sort of relationship build that you can do there because you're both going to get older and, you know, eventually get hopefully the top jobs and you'll remember that time and you'll get intel out of them that's like, yeah, well, you know, so-and-so is really worried about this, but I don't really understand that. And you might be able to say, oh, what they're talking about is this risk or that risk. So, um, or if it's not so much a social thing, it could even be a work thing sometimes where you say, well, look, Let's try and work out some of the issues that, you know, even at a, uh, you know, even at a, I don't want to say, the sub-GC level, it's somebody yeah. who's um, yeah. assisting as an in-house manager or something in a legal role there, they, that, they will have issues too. And it could also be then other things like, well, I have to present and you have to present. Well, maybe we can do a joint presentation and maybe we can make sure, you know, what are the things that we get terrified about and how have we overcome them? I mean, there's all sorts of things, not just technical presentations on, you know, what are the latest updates, at, you know, in, in Corporations Act or something like that. So those sort of skills, that does involve a little bit of bravery and sticking your neck out and sort of asking, oh, look, you know, who's there? But And it doesn't always have to just be one client. There might be a couple that, and they would also like, because you never know. Like, people don't always stay in the same job forever. And so if someone's sort of like, oh, that's good, they're interesting, um, you know, and if you ended up leaving a private practice to go in-house, then people are usually like, great, not going to a competitor. But, you know, you've increased your network as such. Um, you know, so that they're the Absolutely. sort of things yeah. that... Yeah, I remember when I was in private practice, we actually had set something like that up amongst, I think it was, you know, lawyers or senior associates, and we held like a networking event at the firm for clients of that sort of level and I think get your firm to sponsor doing something like that it's very simple whether you know whether it's a bit of an event like something mm. a bit fun or just a drinks it's um just a great way to make some connections and actually meet people do you yeah. do that in-house in yourself like you I'm just wondering if the sort of internally maybe or do you reach out to any like Jane's network is there any other network for you like that not really not at my level mm. but I know particularly in our regulatory team they speak a lot with the other banks to mm -hmm. understand yeah. what's going on, what their positions are, what their challenges are. So I think there's opportunity yeah. almost at every level to be having yeah. those yeah. conversations. Yeah. yeah, Important. I have one question. So as a 14-month partner um, in the construction industry with an all-female team at the moment, <laughs> in disputes, um, we often chat around imposter syndrome and particularly in the construction industry, walking in, it's pretty much a bunch of men on the other side of the table. Do you have any tips for obviously us and, you know, more importantly, women in those scenarios? Because I, I still grapple with walking in and people thinking she should be pouring the water for me. Yeah, I mean, I still see that. You know, yeah. I go to meetings, you know, big negotiations, and I'm like, oh, it's. 2023 and I'm still the only female sitting around the table so I think it's you know it is slowly changing but I think in terms of that sort of feeling of, of imposter I think whatever position you're in you've got to back yourself um, and I think have that confidence just to you know do your thing you're clearly capable you've got a great team you've got to back yourself and I think it's you know you've got you've clearly got clients. Um, I certainly know in a lot of those um, construction companies there's plenty of like-minded females um, and, you know, have, have some networking, like catch up with them on a social level. I think that that absolutely works works well. But, yes, you are going to face it, whatever industry, and you freight logistics, construction, oh, they are, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they I think, are male-dominated I think male a bit still. of it wears away. Like I still have it mm -hmm. every now and then, but I think, I don't know, sometimes you go, 
I've got to get home. I've got to see the kids. I still want to keep my marriage together. So you know what? Fuck off. This is what we're doing. And so you just kind of like get. It's an impatience yeah. where you suddenly go, Ah, I can't yeah. be asked with this. So I think that just comes with a bit of age and time and like sick of. Yeah. I don't want to have to have this feeling of all the other feelings of like, how am I going to turn this document around tonight? Or all the other bits, mm. or my client's not responding, or has no idea on this, or whatever. So I don't know. A little bit of that impatience builds sort of wears up. Away, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think. Look, I think it's probably always going to be there. I mean, I don't know. I've heard sometimes, you know, um, even like you know, someone like Tanya Plibersek will say, "Oh, I've still got," and you sort of go, "Really?" So you know, I guess it lasts in you know all yeah. sorts of things. Um, I don't know, maybe there are a few men that feel that, I don't know. They don't tend to say that, but you know, maybe some of us over drinks, you can tell us. But yeah. I think I think for me, sort of, you know, um, certainly, you know, the older my kids get or the more of responsibilities I have outside or whatever, I just probably just take a deep breath and just go, oh, whatever, and just go, you know. <laughs> you know, be authentic at the end of the yeah, day, yeah. you know. It's like own it and just yeah. be authentic. I don't think there's any right or wrong. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you know, judged on what you do and the work, but also the relationships you build. Like, you know, that sort of depth of relationship and human connection is still really important and often will be, you know, yes, you're technically a great lawyer, but if you've got that connection, people mm. will pick the phone up to you. Yeah. They like working with you. Yeah. I think as well, nothing that I say will help because I feel exactly the same way all the time and I'm constantly giving myself little pep talks throughout the day. But what I would say to you is prove them wrong. But additionally, I have no doubt that you have the confidence of your team and that you are confident in them. So support each other through those situations. And if someone does something really well, say to them, hey, Simone, mm -hmm. you know what? You are great in that yeah. meeting. I really love that contribution. Yeah. I really love that you did that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have no doubt. <laughs> we yeah. together. Yeah. Have that confidence yeah, in each sure. other. So yeah. for me, especially when I've challenged, like taken on difficult topics, writing about them, mm. it can be a bit of a scary world out there. But I know that there are women, mm. I, I do a lot of women in sports, so there are a lot of women standing beside me and that sort of gives me the courage to keep moving forward, even when I'm feeling a little bit nervous or when I'm doing something I haven't done before. So keep the dream team you, together. You do, <laughs> yes. you do tackle sometimes. I've thought of articles where you've tackled it and you've thought, oh, wow, you're coming out on a particular thing. And, you know, if it was Fitzy doing it, you know, maybe it just goes straight <laughs> under, but you're taking a lead and I think, good on you. And you it's know? scary. Ten years yeah. ago there were topics that absolutely I never would have written about, never would have touched, never would have had the courage to. Now I've got a little bit more courage and mm. I write the piece. I never read the comments. Maybe in 10 years' time I'll be able to read the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Yes, that was great. Helpful. Thank you. Anything? Ladies, it has been so informative and very enjoyable. So can you please tell me in thanking James and Mark?